glistened before her. Like jewels melted into flat squares, she thought. Each one was slightly different in its pale, transparent color. Ivory, parchment, the lightest of wines, and the palest of tulips. She wondered how glass was made, but she didn't ask. It would disturb him. Outside the window, the market chattered with the selling of apples and lard and brooms and wooden buckets. She liked the cheese porters in their flat-brimmed red hats and stark white clothes. Their curved yellow carrying platforms stacked neatly with cheese rounds were suspended on ropes between pairs of them, casting brown shadows on the paving stones. Two platforms diagonally placed in the mid-ground between their carriers would make a nice composition with the repeated shapes of those bulging cheese rounds. She'd put a delivery boy wheeling his cart of silver cod in the background against the guild hall, and maybe in the foreground, a couple of lavender gray pigeons pecking crumbs. The carillon from Newkirk ringing out the hour sounded something profound in her chest. All of it is ordinary to everyone but me, she thought. Page 15. All that month, she did not speak. The occasion too momentous to dislodge it with words. He said he'd paint her as long as she didn't shout, and so she did not speak a word. Her chest ached like a dull wound when she realized that her silence did not cause him a moment's reflection or curiosity. When she looked out the corner of her eye at him, she could not tell what she meant to him. Slowly, she came to understand that he looked at her with the same interest he gave to the glass of milk. Maybe it was because she wasn't pretty like Maria. All right, let's pause for a moment, write it down at level one. So now we're coming back to continue our study uh, at level one. Notice you've got Magdalena, who begins, first of all, by looking. And then she is forced to have to do this really boring job of fixing and sewing stuff, and finally she can't take it anymore. She screams out loud, I can't do it, right? And that scream of hers, right, is a scream of rebellion. I hate to mend, she says. Her father, the famous painter, comes in and says, where you're sitting right now, with the light coming through, I want to paint exactly what you look like. So the father asks of her to now just sit and look out a window and be silent. She does it, put it in your notes at level one, for a month. For an entire month, she sits dead still in the exact same spot so her famous father painter can paint her, right? This image of her. And the challenge for her intellectually is to try to come to terms all the thoughts that she has while she is, of course, sitting still and looking. And then there's her father. Notice how we're going to have some interesting conflict that will begin to, dis to, to uh, be created by all of the thoughts in her mind, especially thoughts maybe about her sister. Let's pay attention. She knew her jaws protruded and her watery pale eyes were too widely set. She had a mole on her forehead that she always tried to hide by tugging at her cap. What if no one would want the painting? What then? Lots of it questions, right? It must be her right? fault because she wasn't pretty. She wished he'd say something about her, but all he said, not to her directly, more to himself, was how the sunlight whitened her cap at the forehead, how the shadow at the nape of her neck reflected blue from her collar, or how the sienna of her skirt deepened to Venetian red in the folds. It was never her, she cried to herself, only something surrounding her that she did not make or even contribute to knowingly. Another wish that never would come true, she saw then, even if she lived forever, was that he, that someone, would look at her not as an artistic study, but with love. If two people loved the same thing, she reasoned, then they must love each other, at least a little, even if they never say it. Nevertheless, because he painted with such studied concentration and because she held him in awe, she practiced looking calm for him as she looked out the window. But when she saw the canvas, what she intended as calm looked more like wistfulness. The painting was not bought by the brewer, Peter Klaas van Ryven, who bought most of her father's work. He saw it, but passed over it for another. 
Disgrace seared her so that she could not speak that night. The painting hung without a frame in the outer kitchen where the younger children slept. Eventually, the family had to give up their lodgings at Mechelen on the square and take smaller rooms with Grandmother Maria on the outer Langendijk. Her father stopped taking the ice boat out to the ski, sold it, in fact. He rarely painted. Page 16. So cramped and dark. The younger children boisterous, and a few years later, he died. When she washed him in his bed that last time, his fingers already cold, she had a thought, the shame of which prevented her from uttering. It would make a fine painting, a memorial, the daughter with towel and blue-figured washing bowl at bedside, her hand covering his, the wife exhausted on the Spanish chair, crutching a crucifix, the father-husband, eyes glazed, looking to another landscape. While he painted everyone else, no one was there to paint him, to make him remembered. She yearned to do it, but the task was too fearsome. She lacked the skill, and the one to teach her had never offered. Even though she asked for them, Mother sold his paints and brushes to the Guild of St. Luke. It helped to pay a debt. When Mother became sick with worry, Magdalena had the idea to take the painting to Hendrik van Buten, the baker, because she knew he liked her. And he accepted it, along with one of a lady playing a guitar, for the debt of 617 guilders, six stivers, more than two years' worth of bread. He smiled at her and gave her a bun. Within a year, she married a saddle maker named Nicholas, the first man to notice her, a hard worker whose pores smelled of leather and grease, who taught her a pleasure not of the eyes, but, she soon realized, a man utterly without imagination. They moved to Amsterdam, and she didn't see the painting again for 20 years. All right, let's pause, put it at level one. Notice how quickly we move through Magdalena's life. Notice that while she's sitting there and her father is painting her, the one insight, we might call it an epiphany, let's write it down, the one insight that she has is, my father is looking at me, but he doesn't see me. He doesn't understand me. She's in that key moment in adolescence when so regularly young adolescent young people recognize that so regularly the people who are with them, their parents, the other adults in their life, see them, look at them, but don't understand them, have no idea about what their interests, their longings, their dreams are, and it frustrates her. The painting is finished, but not successful. Then notice father dies, and her instincts are to see her father lying there like it would make a good painting. In other words, she, like her father, had that view of the world. I'm always wanting to somehow capture it in some way, but she points out that She's a little intimidated by the idea of painting such a famous painter, and so she doesn't, she doesn't paint him. The next movement in our text then is for her marriage. So she falls in love with the first man who notices her, Nicholas, but he's a man who has no imagination. And then they move to Amsterdam, and for 20 years she doesn't see this painting. Let's pay attention now to the way that this cutting will finish. Let's see uh, what happens now, how we finish it, all right? In 1696, just after their only living child, Magritte, damp with fever, stopped breathing in her arms, Magdalena read in the Amsterdamske Current of a public auction of 134 paintings by various artists. Several outstandingly artful paintings, the notice said, including 21 works most powerfully and splendidly painted by the late J. Vermeer of Delft, will be auctioned May 16, 1 o'clock, at the Auda Hirin Lodgement. Only a week away, she thought of Hendrik. Of course, he couldn't be expected to keep those paintings forever. Hers might be there. The possibility kept her awake nights. Entering the auction gallery, she was struck again by that keenest of childhood wishes, to make a record not only of what she saw, but how. Page 17. The distance she'd come from that, and not even a child to show for it. She shocked herself by asking involuntarily what had been the point of having lived. 
wishing had not been enough. Was it a mistake that she didn't beg him to teach her? Maybe not. If she'd seen that eventually with help she could paint, it might have made the years of birthing and dying harder. But then the birthing and dying would have been painted and the pain given. It would have served a purpose. Would that have been enough to tell a truth in art? She didn't know. To see again so many of Father's paintings was like walking down an avenue of her childhood. The honey-colored window, the Spanish chair, the map she'd stared at, dreaming, hanging on the wall, Grandmother Maria's golden water pitcher, Mother's pearls and yellow satin jacket. They commanded such a reverence for her now that she felt they all had souls. Notice how the reading is called Magdalena Looking. Jot down really quickly why that's such a great title for this cutting. Here she is, 20 years later. She's lost a child, tragically. And she reads in the newspaper that her father, of course now passed, there's a whole bunch of his paintings that are going to be sold or auctioned. So she decides to show up, which obviously begs a bit of predicting questions, right? What do you predict is going to be what happens next? As she shows up, she cannot help but be reminded of the past. The student saying the other day about this reading, it was like the other day when I stumbled onto a photo album that my ma had, and I started flipping through it, and I saw pictures of me when I was five with my family, as my family was then, not my family now, because all kinds of crazy things have happened in my life. And it made me remember all of the stuff of my mind. Notice as well on page 17, the brilliance of this piece. Raising the question of the value of art. What is the power of art? Well, obviously the artist takes whatever the artist sees and the pain of the artist's life and somehow translates that pain into something valuable. She begs the question, should I have bugged my dad to teach me how to paint so that I could at least pass on my pain? And then, of course, all of a sudden, there she is looking at herself. Let's enjoy now the last moments of this passage. And suddenly there she was on canvas, framed. Her knees went weak. Hendrik hadn't kept it. Even though he liked her, he hadn't kept it. Almost a child she was, it seemed to her, gazing out the window instead of doing her mending, as if by the mere act of looking she could send her spirit out into the world. And those shoes she had forgotten. How she loved the buckles and thought they made her such a lady. Eventually she'd worn the soles right through, but now, brand new, the buckles glinted on the canvas, each with a point of golden light. A bubble of joy surged upward right through her. No, she wasn't beautiful, she owned, but there was a simplicity in her young face that she knew the years had eroded, a stilled longing in the forward lean of her body, a wishing in the intensity of her eyes. The painting showed she did not yet know that lives end abruptly, that much of living is repetition and separation, that buttons forever need re-sewing, no matter how ferociously one works the thread, that nice things almost happen. Still, a woman overcome with wishes, she wished Nicholas would have come with her to see her in the days of her century post wonder, when life and hope were new and full of possibility. But he had seen no reason to close up the shop on such a whim. Let's pause for a moment because as your textbook will say to you on page 17, this is the powerful symbol of this reading. Here she is, standing, looking at herself. I've sometimes asked my seniors what I'll ask to you as sophomores. What do you imagine your picture of yourself this year as a sophomore will look like to you when you have a sophomore child in high school? By the way, don't say it won't be you. That'll curse you, right? What will it be like? to be that individual who has a sophomore child in high school, but to look back at the picture of your sophomore year and to see what, is, what will be the insight. Notice the, the uh, power of this one. The painting showed, I'm reading with you on 17, the painting showed she did not yet know, she's so young, right, that lives end abruptly, that much of living is repetition 
and separation. There you go. Let's write it down. Repetition and separation. The symbolism of this one work of art. Everything is about repeating, 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 and yet at the same time, a certain kind of separation. Can we put it this way? Life goes on. Life goes on, doesn't it? All right, let's finish the reading now on page 18. We're going to concentrate now at the end of this reading on conflict and plot. Take a look at it. Here we go real quickly, all right? She stood on tiptoe and didn't breathe when her painting was announced. Her hand in her pocket closed tight around the 24 guilders, some of it borrowed from two neighbor women, some of it taken secretly from the box where Nicholas kept money for leather supplies. It was all she could find, and she didn't dare ask for more. He would have thought it foolish. Twenty, said a man in front of her. It's auctioning now, yes? Two, said another. Twenty-four, she said so loud and fast, the auctioneer was startled. Did he see something similar in her face? He didn't call for another bid. The painting was hers. Twenty-five. Her heart cracked. The rest was a blur of sound. It finally went to a man who kept conferring with his wife, which she took as a good sign that it was going to a nice family. Forty-seven guilders. Most of the paintings sold for much more, but forty-seven was fine, she thought. In fact, it filled her momentarily with what she'd been taught was the sin of pride. Then she thought of Hendrik, and a pain lashed through her. Forty-seven guilders minus the auctioneer's fee didn't come close to what her family had owed him. She followed the couple out into the drizzle of Herrengracht, wanting to make herself known to them, just to have a few words, but then dropped back. She had such bad teeth now, and they were people of means. The woman wore stockings. What would she say to them? She didn't want them to think she wanted anything. She walked away slowly along a wet stone wall that shone iridescent, and the wetness of the street reflected back the blue of her best dress. Water spots appeared fast, turning the cerulean to deep ultramarine, father's favorite blue. Page 19. Light rain pricked the charcoal green canal water into delicate dark lace and she wondered if it had ever been painted just that way, or if the life of something as inconsequential as a water drop could be arrested and given to the world in a painting, or if the world would care. She thought of all the people in all the paintings she had seen that day, not just fathers, in all the paintings of the world, in fact. Their eyes, the particular turn of a head, their loneliness or suffering or grief, was borrowed by an artist to be seen by other people throughout the years who would never see them face to face. People who would be that close to her, she thought, a matter of a few arm's lengths, looking, looking, and they would never know her. All right, let's pause. Notice the ending. She doesn't get the, pay the painting. She's brought money to try to, you know, buy the painting, but she only has barely half the amount of money that the painting goes for. She is now, of course, a woman who is very poor. Bad teeth is an indication of that, right? And so she has to leave unfulfilled. She doesn't get the image, the painting that she longed to get to hold on to. At the very end of the reading, of course, then, she has to come to terms with this is the nature of life, right? Life moves on. Everything goes forward, if you will. Let's jump really quickly to 2A. What for you is one message from a text like this? Some students will say it is a life goes on. We can't always reclaim our wishes, our dreams. Get used to disappointment is maybe a, a kind of uh, sad reading of, of this. Some students have focused on the relationship between father and daughter. Let's jump now to 2B. What is the key symbol of the title, uh, Magdalena, looking? What's going on with that, right? What is that one about? That is to say, the, the whole different ways that sight and insight happens. I mean, think about that. We, we use the term in our freshman year that we use again, perspicacity. 
We have outside, I can see you, or perspicacity, insight. Insight doesn't mean I can roll my eyes back into my head and see my brain. It means rather understanding, insight. What is the key symbol that leads to that understanding? Some will see the painting itself as a symbol of some kind of a passage of time. You can't reclaim everything from your youth and the dreams of your youth. 3A, what's the, what's the, mess, what's the key t uh, text for you that teaches this kind of idea? I'm just going to take you back to a text we worked with in our freshman year since we're at the beginning of our sophomore year. You'll remember that when Odysseus arrives back in Ithaca, his beautiful wife Penelope, and yet it's been 20 years that he's been gone, and she doesn't look the same, and she's worried about, will he still love me because I'm not physically beautiful anymore, that tension. What is the text for you that reminds you, or maybe a song that you listen to, that reminds you that life goes on. There is this passage of time. And you are not now the student that you were at the beginning of your freshman year. And you are not now the student that you will be at the beginning of your senior year. Or as we said, when someday you have a child who is starting his or her sophomore year of high school. What will that be like for you? Finally, 3B. What is for you the moment in your life that you can remember wanting to be seen, wanting to be understood, wanting to be appreciated, and it didn't happen? And the frustration that was associated with that, you wanted to be seen, you wanted to be understood, you wanted to be appreciated, and it didn't happen. Well, there you go, an introduction to reading of, uh, and annotating closely a literary text. I hope that maybe this challenged you a bit. Thank you.